The Theosophical Society presents Jeffrey Hodson in a talk entitled The Law of Correspondence. Now we are going to think over together a subject which has been more than once presented from your platforms here and lucidly expounded in articles in the magazine. So for some of you, doubtless the idea are called the law of correspondences may be fairly familiar. It includes the concept of the unity and interaction of the macrocosm or universe with the microcosm which is man. Universe and man are said to be in constant harmonized interaction. Perhaps that explains that mystery to which I referred yesterday as to how certain vegetables and lower animal organisms know even within laboratory conditions the phases of sun and moon at which they reach maximum absorption. Mystery to science. How do they know? Well, perhaps this idea of interaction between cosmos and planet and all upon it, including ourselves, may offer a partial explanation. Theosophy, I understand, carries the proposition still further, telling not only of the unity and interaction between cosmos and man, but also that there is a close similarity between the processes by which the powers in the cosmos and the powers in man become manifest and evolve. Same laws, same processes governing both. Eliphas Levy, the great theosophist of the last century, put it this way, the mystery of the earthly and mortal man is after the mystery of the supernal and immortal one. H. P. Blavatsky expounds the whole doctrine quite fully and, yes, gives us many tables of these correspondences between, say, parts of ourselves, physical and superphysical, and corresponding parts of the universe. In what way? Perhaps I might draw upon one of her tables from memory. For example, the frontal brain, our, our frontal brain, the pituitary gland, the Ajna chakram, brow chakram, and the causal body of man, these are all in mutual resonance, but also in mutual resonance with the great regents of the planet Mercury and Neptune and the star angels of the zodiacal signs Gemini and Virgo. An extraordinary system of interrelated, continually interacting mutual resonances, should I call them, between cosmos and its parts 
and parts of ourselves, you and I. So that our pituitary gland, for example, so very important to our lives as it is, is in mutual vibration with the regent of the planet Venus and also of Neptune. Somehow or other we're in radio connection or radar perhaps and also the signs Taurus and Libra. I've, if you go back, let me correct that. The frontal brain, pituitary gland, Ajna chakram, causal body of man, in correspondence with Venus, Taurus, and Libra. Pineal, if you like, just to illustrate before I expound further. Pineal gland, in correspondence with Mercury, Neptune, Gemini and Virgo. That's right. Thank you, Sandra. So, according to H.P. Blavatsky, man is described as a collective aggregate of all that has ever existed, does now exist, and ever will exist throughout the eternity of eternities. Active, I suppose, or latent and potential. All that has been, is and ever will be, is, in terms of vibratory possibilities, present in every human being. And all these intercommunications, I understand, work automatically in all people, all of us and without our knowing it. But as evolution proceeds, people become more and more conscious both of their relationship with each other and with nature feeling a deepening kinship, but also of relationship with the universe as a whole. Evidently, evolution universalizes man. Now, meditation upon these various correspondences can be very helpful for some temperaments, though not for all, and I'm not mm, advocating it. But those who do practice it can find that such meditation touches and quickens into activity certain essences and substances in the nadis or canals and the chakras to which they lead. There's a kind of quickening goes on as a result of tuning in to these tremendous powers apparently without us. And so such people who sensitize themselves become in vibrational sympathy with all the associated correspondences and with the great lords of the planets and the regions of the signs. As I think of that myself, trying to understand it, seems to me that the whole idea of brotherhood, kinship with the one life, is thus extended. Far beyond the limits of our globe, where we're trying to establish it, with one another right out into a kind of universal brotherhood of the cosmos as a whole. There's a subject for meditation. Apparently one can draw 
planetary, solar and cosmic powers into oneself at appropriate levels so that they become active powers within one. How do they work, do we suppose? Well, I suggest that mutual resonance between the bodies, glands and chakras of man and the planet's zodiacal signs and their archangelic regions become increasingly act, becomes increasingly active until at last it becomes so strong that these influences are, are, are responded to and even felt. And also vibrational attunement between the life and the vehicles of the solar logos and the corresponding parts of the kingdoms of nature and the bodies of man. All of these make up one interactive, continually communicating totality of existence. And we men here, we're part of it all, but we seem to know so little of the tremendous potentiality of our harmonious relationship with the whole solar system and the cosmos. Of course, this is not in the very least new. It's been taught by teachers from the very earliest times. Old Lao Tzu, the Chinese philosopher, put it wonderfully, saying, the universe is a man on a large scale. The universe is a man, he said, on a large scale. The very same idea. And I suppose, with all due deference to the old philosopher, we might reverse his dictum and say that a universe, that man is a universe on a small scale. Perfectly true, you and I, we're universes, potentially, on a small scale. Yes, and the idea is to be found that if we were not, we couldn't know anything about the universe. For you can only know of that which is outside of you, it is said, by means and through the presence of that within you as well. The German philosopher Goethe put it beautifully. The eye, he said, could not see the sun if it did not contain the sun within itself. And how could divine things enrapture us if we did not carry the power of God within us? Beautifully put. Deeply occult. Again, if you like. The eye could not see the sun if it did not contain the sun within itself. And how could divine things enrapture us if we did not carry the power of God within us. So, in our study of correspondences, then we are in the presence of one of those universal ideas. That mystic and Platonist of the Middle Ages in England, Sir Thomas Brown, wrote, Life is a pure flame and we are lit by an invisible sun within us. Life is a pure flame, and we are lit by an invisible sun within us. And you know, by thinking of these things and meditating upon them, they become real to you, till you, you can almost begin to know something 
of that great orb of power and light represented within yourself. It's simply put in the book of Proverbs where we read the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Isn't that nice? Same idea, of course, simply put. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. And in Genesis, as we so well know, the great Lord, the demiurge, or creator of all, the active creator of all, said, let us make man in our image. And again in the wisdom of Solomon, for God created man to be immortal, to be an image of his own eternity created he him. So you see, we're not just separate people here. <laughs> Each one of us as closed up within our skin, we might think we are. Not, not at all. Not only are we all one in terms of spirit and life with each other, but with the cosmos as a whole and its transcendent and imminent deity. All one. Now let me present this to you in terms of four basic ideas. The whole universe, with all its parts, from the plane of Adi, first plane, down to this one, the physical, is interlocked interwoven to make a single whole one body one organism one life one consciousness next all the organs in this macrocosm though apparently separated in space and plane of manifestation, are in fact harmoniously interrelated. A and, yes, from this point of view, distance has no meaning, really. It's an illusion under which we suffer, of course. But it doesn't make the slightest difference to our relationship to that which seems to us to be distant. It doesn't matter, does it, whether our radio receiver is just outside the walls of the transmitting station or 50 miles away, as long as it's tuned in. Distance doesn't really enter into it at all. So the whole Syrian cosmos, <coughs> which includes the zodiac, component solar systems, planets, kingdoms of nature, planes of nature, their inhabitants, the elements, the colors, the rays, and so on, all this constitutes a coordinated whole. Because all these parts are in correspondence or harmonious interaction with each other all the time. Hmm. Uh, Perhaps I could illustrate. Supposing one single cell in our foot, you know, on one's foot, big toe if you like, 
were sufficiently developed to be able to obtain and use a telescope. And happened to be looking up into the vast distances of the heavens and caught sight of a cell here, just here. Looking right up to here and saw a cell there in his telescope. What would he think? He'd say, well, far out in the immensities of space, there's another, just like myself, formulated like me, but far, 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 many cell diameters away from where I am. Total delusion. They're all part of one body. <laughs> The single cell, however intelligent, couldn't know that. So you and I are very much like those single cells, unless we're illumined. We can't very easily know that uh, we're all parts of one great body. We can't see the connecting parts, that's all. like the three blind men who contacted the, the trunk and the foreleg and tail of the elephant. and One said, oh, yes, here's a snake. And the other one said, oh, it's the trunk of a tree and oh, there's a rope down here. They thought they were different in time and different in space and different in character. They weren't at all. They were all parts of one elephant, though the connecting mass was hidden from them because they were blind. Now may not this be true, the truth about us, our relationship with each other and the whole universe, distance and separateness and division, pure illusions, and we are all one. And I suppose yoga is a process of learning to see and know and feel the connecting mass which makes all things one. However, though that is in general true, that all the parts of the macrocosm, though apparently separated in space, and plane of manifestation are in fact harmoniously interrelated but next step in thought certain organs are more intimately grouped together than others they resonate harmoniously with each other like the notes of a chord they share a common basic frequency of oscillation. Or in occultism they're said to correspond. So this is true, as I said at the beginning, of a sign of the zodiac. A planet, an element, a color, a principle of man, and a part of man's physical body. These are all vibrating together on a common chord. That's the idea of correspondences. And HPB says that knowledge of these correspondences provides a key to the understanding of the universe, of man's place therein, and relationship therewith, and also a key to human development and so to the solution of human problems. It's very important information. Evidently, hence her placing it in the secret doctrine. She says this law of correspondences is the basic science behind all life and the key to all magic. And knowing it, she says, the rationale of both astrology and karma become clear. So, it would appear 
were encouraged to accept and study this idea that knowledge of these correspondences provides a key to the understanding of the universe, of our place as human people, our place in the universe, a key to our relationship with the universe, and of our development within and with the whole. And so it is an important part of the key to the solution of human problems. It's far-fetched, though it may seem difficult to understand. Nevertheless, it's evidently important knowledge, revealing as it does the rationale of both astrology and karma. What else do we learn? Well, shall we look at the way it's put in other systems of theosophical thought. Take the Kabbalah, for example, described as a theosophy of the Hebrew. The inner secret, essential knowledge. Kabbalah, meaning oral tradition, at the heart of Hebraism. I will read from a Kabbalistic statement, slowly. A very wonderful statement. The same, but the way they put it. Listen, friend. In the chain of being, that's how they start, which to me is a miraculous start. The chain of being. We're all part of a great chain. Links, probably, in that Wondrous chain. However, that's how they begin. In the chain of being, everything is magically contained in everything else. Where you stand, there stand all the worlds. What, they repeat the hermetic axiom, what is below is also above. And that what is inside is also outside. And ceaselessly acts upon everything else. Difficult part coming now. More difficult. Man is portrayed in Kabbalism as a symbolic Transparency. Through which the secret of the cosmos could be discerned. Again, man is portrayed as a symbolic transparency through which the secret of the cosmos could be discerned. They stress, the Kabbalists do, the interrelation of all worlds and all levels of being. And they affirm that everything is connected with everything else and that everything is in, interpenetrates everything else according to exact, if unfathomable, law. And they, they also say, everything possesses its infinite depths which from every point of view may be contemplated. Difficult, I know. I can't make it simpler, really. It, it, it means I should 
understand that every existing being and thing is endlessly correlated with the whole of creation. Expands the mind, doesn't it? You find yourself somewhere over there, halfway out to the sun. But every existing being and thing is endlessly correlated with the whole of creation. Everything mirrors everything else. And man is a synthesis of all the spiritual forces which have gone into the objective manifestation of the one alone. Another way of putting it, everywhere there is but one rhythm, one motion of the waves of life. And the true spirit essence of the universe is everywhere, above as well as below, in heaven and on earth. And every man they say, reflects in his organism the hidden organism of the cosmos. In the Bhagavad Gita you read, the light of all lights beyond darkness is sealed in the hearts of men. I won't go on, lest I tire you. But I will close with a few lines of a favourite poem by a favourite poet, Francis Thompson, who knew this. And in his poem, The Mistress of Vision, concerned with the opening up of consciousness to the realization of one's unity, not only with each other, but with the solar system and the solar Lord, our Lord, the Son himself, that effulgent one at, a, at the heart of an vibrant in every atom of our universe and our air and our bodies. All one. All one. And in tune. And I think myself of yoga as processes whereby we can know this central truth. Man's spirit and God's spirit are one spirit. And as the Gita also says, the one Lord seated in the hearts of all beings. Thou art the one Lord as the inner ruler immortal is seated in the hearts of all beings. And here's the way Francis Thompson puts it. When to the new eyes of thee all things by immortal power near or far hiddenly to each other linked are that thou canst not st 
stir a flower without the troubling of a star. He knew, you see. When to the new eyes of thee all things by immortal power near or far hiddenly to each other linked are he wrote that thou canst not stir a flower without the troubling of a star such fellow students is the idea of the law of correspondences. Man is not remote from any portion of the cosmos. One life nourishes, one life sustains and unites all parts and all beings. Ultimately, because all this is within him, man in his turn becomes as an active logos. And if he chooses that office, directs the emanation of a solar system. And you and I are on the way there too. And the power to achieve is in us now, working actively. And the study of the subject of correspondences is therefore of great importance. Correspondences means the interrelationships by virtue of mutual resonances of the several parts of man himself with those parts of corresponding areas, forces, powers and intelligences of the universe. That thou canst not stir a flower without the troubling of a star. Such is the idea which our great teacher H.P.B. presents to us. <laughs>